what I was asked to talk about is faculty collaboration and curricular innovation. So when I start, anytime I'm talking about uh, curricular innovation or collaboration, I always start where everyone in the University Innovation Alliance starts, where everybody pretty much in this room starts, start with the learner. And what we know is happening in higher education, as we've heard about all morning, is that part of the challenge we're dealing with is not just lots more learners, but a greater diversity of learners. And I don't just mean diversity in terms of racial diversity, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, age diversity, socioeconomic status diversity, gender identity diversity, sexual orientation diversity. All of those diversities are important. But I also mean a greater diversity in the background knowledge, the relevant skills, and the future goals that our learners bring to our classrooms where we've been talking a lot this morning about sort of macro level trends in education. Where my research is, is very much at the uh, much micro nano level. It's at the level of the student learning moment. So I'm gonna be talking about the diversity that's critical to understand at that moment of student learning. So there's all those kinds of diversity, but also diversity in the way the learners attribute their experience, the meaning they're making out of when I'm struggling with this, or I don't understand that, or I got an F in this, or I got an A in that, the causal attribution that they make to why did that happen. Okay, so with that as a background, now we're gonna talk about innovation, curricular innovation. And most of the curricular innovation that I tend to look at is the innovation that's enabled by technology. So I always like to ask this question of the room because I like to know something about the prior knowledge or the thinking of the people with whom I'm speaking. What is the power of this technology to transform higher education? Okay, so no one's shouting stuff out. So I'll just tell you usually the three things people do shout out. There they are. Okay, so uh, the first one, Access and convenience. The power of having a computer technology supporting education is a learner can learn anytime, any place. Access and convenience. The other thing people say is, yeah, that's okay. But really the power is all this really cool stuff we can do with the technology that we can't do in our classrooms. So I've sort of summed that up as the simulation capability. I was talking to somebody here this morning about the big power of virtual, um, virtual reality, sort of creating immersive environments, or even just creating virtual lab environments, all the different cool things we can do. We can have in engineering classes, we can have students build bridges, they fall down, nobody gets killed, but they get that experience. So that simulation capability. Other people say, mm, that's all cool, Candace, but really the power of this technology is not an individual interacting with a computer, it's that that computer is connected to an internet. So we can connect the learners to each other, we can connect the learners to multiple resources, to experts, to the world. The real power of this technology is connection. Okay. So now I want to know what you guys think. I'm going to, and then since we're such a big group, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands and vote. So if I had to force your feet to the fire and say, which of those three powers of the technology are you betting on that you think is really the big transformative power, which one would you vote for? Okay, got a minute? Great. How many think it's all about access and convenience? That's really the big transformation. Raise your hands, I'd be proud of your perspective. Okay, good, good, everyone, great. How many people think, no, really, it's this cool stuff, the virtual reality simulation, cool stuff we can do with the computers. Okay, and how many are like, mm, you guys are all so, you know, 20, 20th century, it's really about connection. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was gonna bet on that with this group. Um, okay, how many of you are sitting there thinking, uh, wait, she, Susanna said I was part of the Graduate School of Education. 
why am I giving you a stupid multiple choice question? <laughs> yeah, okay. How many of you wish I'd put up there all of the above? That's really what you want, all of the above. Okay. How many of you think it should have been none of the above? Okay. Okay. Well, actually, I agree. Stupid multiple choice question. Um, and I would have voted for none of the above. I think all of those things are important, but the actual power of what's going to transform education with this technology is what Google has already figured out. It's what Netflix has figured out. It's what Amazon has figured out. It's what we've spent a large part of this morning already talking about. The power of this technology is not using it to push stuff out, but to push it to the interface. Because in the interface, we can observe the learner. Google, Netflix, Amazon, they are observing us in their interfaces all the time. Why? Sell more stuff. You know, sell more stuff, okay. Sell more stuff. They want to because in the interface they can observe us and they can learn us better, learn about us as consumers both individual consumers, so they can target us better, but also consumers in general, so they can come up with better marketing strategies. So a lot of people think that's kind of creepy that I'm talking about education in that same way. Um, I'm not talking about looking at learners as consumers. I'm talking about looking at learners as learners. We can watch their interactions in the interface and understand them both individually better and also how learning writ large with a capital L happens better. And that is what I would argue is the real power of the technology. That we can take the students' interactions with the environments we create and use the data we generate from those interactions to drive very powerful feedback loops to the actors in the education system. One of those actors, of course, is the student, the learner. And the big innovation that is sweeping through our institutions now is this promise of personalized and adaptive learning. Taking the data from the student interactions modeling it, and based on that, either feeding that information back into the system so the system can make some kind of autonomous decision about what to give the learner next, or giving that information to an act, another actor in the system to better support the learner. The other person uh, that the uh, data can support is the instructor. And I spent a lot of time looking at the data that we're collecting from students interacting with our courseware, and we're still thinking about how to present that information to faculty so they can make informed decisions about what they do to support their students in their classroom. And this is just a small example of the kinds of data representation we can do for faculty. This is out of a statistics course that we're actually um, doing some, we have a research partnership at Georgia State right now on this statistics course. And what the faculty member can see is for each module that the learners are working through, um, these are the learning outcomes that the module was designed to support the learners to achieve. And that bar over there, it's kind of hard to see the colors. It's red and orange and green and gray. Gives you a quick snapshot on the prediction we're making about the students in your class, how well they've achieved that outcome. So students in green, that would say what we're predicting is if you were to give the students an assessment that day in class that assessed that outcome, the students in green would nail it. The students in red, hmm, they're, they're trying, but they're really struggling. Uh, in gray, anybody have an idea what gray means? Yeah, they haven't participated enough. This is, these predictions are being driven by a statistical model. So all that's saying is they haven't done enough interactions with activities that are predicting that outcome for the system to make any kind of a reliable prediction. So it's just gray. Uh, the faculty member can click into those bars and see the names of the students that are in each of those groups for that outcome. 
Um, I removed the names because I took this off of an actual course. Um, they can also see that larger outcome um, has a bunch of component skills and knowledge, so they can also see for that outcome, for those students, what's the distribution of those students on those sub-skills. So if a faculty member had a lot of time, they could spend a lot of time before class sort of really getting a sense of where are my students today and deciding how I'm going to do my instruction. If they don't have as much time, then they can just stay at a higher level and say, oh, I'm gonna spend time talking about this and not so much time talking about that. Um, the, other, the other group that we can use the same data to give feedback to is the design team. Now, there was some conversation this morning about instructional designers. Um, all the courseware that we develop is not designed by a single faculty member. It's designed by, by a team of the uh, content area experts, in this case, maybe statisticians, with instructional designers, we call them learning engineers, um, with learning science researchers, with human computer interaction experts, with software engineers, uh, with universal design for learning folks, because we believe it takes that diversity of expertise working together to really design an effective learning experience. And then the last feedback loop is to the learning researchers. Because as I said, we try and use what we think we know about human learning to inform the design of the learning environment. Now, getting so you might say, why, why do we need to still keep researching this stuff? Uh, don't we know what works? I mean, we've been doing this for decades, and we've got a lot of research, so we kind of know what works. Let's stop studying it and just start making sure that we do it. How, how many people kind of think that's sort of where we are? Just, Oh, interesting. I usually, yeah, some folks, okay, I usually get, there's a lot of, usually a much greater number of people who, who uh, the Gates Foundation being one of them, who thinks, no, we know enough, we just, the problem is implementation. Um, so one of the things uh, one of my former colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, Ken Katinger, used to say is learning theories are like toothbrushes. Everybody has one, nobody wants to use anybody else's. <laughs> and that's part of the challenge. So when you get into these design questions, you start falling prey to these, what I would call, education wars. And you've probably, if anybody who's been in a, in a place where people are trying to make a decision about what's best for a learner, you've been in these arguments where something like, okay, is it better if you're teaching an introductory course to give the learner more help with the basics, they just need the foundation, or do you give them more challenging tasks to facilitate deeper and more robust understanding? Which is better? Well, the real answer is it depends. Once you make that decision, then you have to say, okay, let's say we're deciding we're gonna give them uh, more help with basics, then do I give them focused practice, gradually widen the practice, or distributed practice? Once I make that choice, I'm gonna gradually widen practice, then I'm gonna give them study worked examples, problem solving, a mix of those. If I'm giving them study worked examples, then I'm giving them concrete examples, abstract examples, a mix, and as you can see, the decision tree gets exponential pretty quickly. And that's just a differentiation decision for one learner at one point in time. So when you multiply that by the number of learners we have in a learning experience times the number of times you have to make that decision, you start to see why we need a better science to guide making that decision. So what science do we use? Of course, um, now back to what I say the challenges are about the learner that we're gonna differentiate on. One of them is their background knowledge, their relevant skills, their future goals. And when we're trying to differentiate instruction for learners that are diverse on those dimensions, then the key is trying to figure out where the learner is in their learning trajectory and giving them something to do that is just beyond what they can do right now. A uh, theorist by the name of Vygotsky called that the zone of proximal development. And so the idea is you want to be able to give the learner something that's not too easy. Some people call it the Goldilocks zone. It's not too easy. It's not too hard. They could do it, but they would need some kind of scaffolding and support 
in order to accomplish it. That's, that's the critical place where learning actually happens. So, but to figure out where that is, then you need some way of being able to assess and decide on each learner. And so for that, we come to cognitive science. Um, so cognitive science gives us some tools to be able to unpack learning processes and be able to figure out where a learner might be and then what kind of tasks to give them based on our assessment of where their zone of proximal development is. And even from cognitive science, we have some, cognitive science moving into education science, we have some things that we know that is kind of counterintuitive to how we currently teach. Uh, an example I'll give you of that is, um, so how many of you uh, g explain something to your learners? I'm gonna give you a principle, and then I'm gonna give you some examples that illustrate that principle. That's a really common pedagogical move. Explain something, I'm doing it right now. Explain something and then give you an example to practice with. Turns out that on average, it's actually better to give learners, when, when it's a more complex principle, give them a couple of examples rather than explaining the principle and giving them the example. It's also better, it turns out, to give the students something where they're trying to solve the problem without knowing how to solve the problem before you explain how to solve the problem. So, and it's not that they're going to figure out the canonical solution, um, but that struggle essentially prepares their knowledge structures so that when you explain something to them, they have the experience of, oh, that's why you divide by n. That makes sense versus just trying to understand the formula for standard deviation. Why, why is there n even in there? Why do you take a square root? What does that make sense? But if they try to struggle and figure out how to represent variability, then when you explain the, the formula for standard deviation, they have a knowledge structure in which to hang it. So the sort of general guideline is that experience and explanation both support different kinds of knowledge development, and they work really well together, but usually with experience coming before explanation. Okay, um, but the other piece that I wanna focus a little more on is the other side of the learner up there, which is the attribution piece, the sense that the learner makes out of their experience. And for that uh, science, we turn mostly to social psychology. When I was at Carnegie Mellon doing the Open Learning Initiative, most of the focus, almost all of the focus was on the cognitive side, taking really complex cognitive tasks and unpacking them and figuring out how to create guided instructional environments to support learners to develop those skills. Since I've been at Stanford, I have a whole new host of learning researchers with whom to collaborate. And a lot of the researchers at Stanford focus less on the cognitive components and more on the socio-emotional, social psychological components. Like, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard of my colleague Carol Dweck and her work on academic mindset. This is the idea that it's, that some students believe that intelligence, their own intelligence or their own ability is fixed. And so then when they struggle, like when they're trying to learn statistics and they can't get the central limit theorem, then their explanation to themselves is, oh yeah, I've never been good at math. I'm just not that smart. I just can't get this. And so they stop persisting and they stop engaging because they don't believe they can learn it. So if you can take a learner like that and help them develop a growth mindset where they recognize that struggle is not because they're fundamentally not a math person, but just because math is hard. And actually that struggle, in, in that struggle, they've actually gotten smarter. Um, again, uh, we're doing some research with uh, uh, Georgia State along experimenting with different approaches to, and timing of mindset intervention. The other uh, kind of social psychological uh, theories are my colleague Jeff Cohen, who works on um, uh, social belonging and on um, gender identity, not gender identity, identity threat. And one of our uh, doctoral students who just, I'm mean, gonna talk about the work of two doctoral students who are, I'm just hooding this June. One of them is Rene Kazilchek, and he just had his research published in Science a Magazine, 
And this was a, some research she did on um, some of the theory that's come out of the social belonging and identity threat literature. But he did this research in a MOOC. Uh, we're doing, a, in my lab, my Lytics lab, we're doing a lot of research in MOOCs, partly because you have huge N and uh, lots and lots of data. So this was a study that involved 1.8 million uh, learners and across 55 uh, MOOC courses. And what that scatter plot is, if, if you can't see it, it is the um, OECD Human Development Index by country, and then the completion rate of the course. And so the things to the left are lower, uh, lower countries that are rated lower on the OECD Development Index. And to the, uh, as you move along the x-axis, they're higher. So like 1.0 would be like, Western European, the US, et cetera. And then the um, uh, X -ax uh, Y axis is completion rate. So you can see there's a pretty strong linear relationship uh, between the country of origin that you're from and your, the probability that you're gonna complete the course. Uh, and so one of his theories was that, that certain countries, if you're from a certain country, you will experience identity threat in a MOOC that's being delivered by a place like Stanford. So he looked at it and sure enough, that was the case. And so he introduced into these MOOCs um, a classic kind of identity threat intervention, which is called um, a, uh, a, belong a social belonging um, self-affirmation intervention, which is a very short, it's a 10 minute activity that a learner does at the very beginning of the course, which essentially affirms other parts of their identity and their value um, before engaging in an environment where they, are gonna, where they believe that their identity is stereotyped or threatened. And as you can see, just that very short intervention, both in the original experiment and on replication, essentially obliterated the achievement gap between people from less developed OECD countries and highly developed OECD countries. And you can read about all the details of that in science. The other, um, the other, and I added these after listening to the conversations this morning and looking at some of the posters, because um, social belonging and identity threat can be at play not just at the micro level that I study, the learning event, but also in things like persistence and, uh, and dropout. So another uh, doctoral student who's also getting hooded now, um, Shannon Brady, this was her work where she was looking at when students are put on academic probation. So, uh, and, and typically when, when we institutions put learners on academic probation, they get sent a letter informing them that they've been put on academic probation. They usually get some information about resources they can use in order to get off probation and all that kind of stuff. So they looked at the letters and um, noticed and were concerned that, that essentially receiving that letter for a learner would trigger a bunch of identity threat um, and, social, and sense of social belonging. Oh yeah. I didn't really belong here anyway. I'm not really good enough. My institution, you know, I didn't make the cut. So what they did was they still, uh, so they took the basic letter, so based on all of this literature around implicit um, theories, shame, stigma, social belonging, power of narratives, all of this literature, took that and then looked at the letters that institutions were sending to students on probation. And, cha and changed the letter, or changed one version of the letter to make it attuned to all of this theory. It had all the same information, but the tone in which it was written, the words that it used, were attuned to what the theory would say if the learner, if we were concerned about the learner um, being vulnerable to identity threat. And the response was this is, the, so, so we did a controlled experiment where it took students who were actually being sent um, letters who were put on academic probation and half the learners um, got sent the standard letter that the university always sent and the other half got sent this attuned letter. Same information, just attuned to the way it was communicated. And this is the uh, results. Both looking at a year later, were the students still enrolled so the students in the green were the students that were still enrolled. 
and the students in the middle color, they were suspended, and the students in the top just completely had dropped out. So you can see the change between just the standard letter and the revised letter in that outcome. And then also looking at a year later where the students off probation, you can see a significantly large number of students were off probation from the uh, revised uh, letter. And in, for the standard letter, a large number of them, well, what the middle one, the legend kind of got cut off. There's uh, the, the green is off probation, the middle is still on probation, and the orange is on a more severe status, like suspended or something like that. And this, uh, I should say, this research was done on an elite university on the West Coast, um, which isn't named, um, but, but she's actually running this study um, at five other institutions of a diversity of Carnegie classifications. We just don't have the data for the other universities yet, but should have it by the end of summer. Okay, so those are the two, so the, the last part of science that's advancing that I wanted to bring to your attention is what's really enabling all of this rapid change is the advances in computer science and data science. And this is probably the field that is advancing the fastest that is going to have the biggest impact on enabling the advances in the other sciences which are material to student learning. And I'll just give you a, a, a quick example is back in uh, 2011, Sebastian Thrun, who was at Stanford Junior University, I had to put the junior in there for, um, for Ed, but uh, uh, Sebastian Thrun said, it's a no-brainer. In 50 to 60 years from now, cars will be driving themselves. That was his big futuristic statement in 2011, given the current pace of development of artificial intelligence. And then here we have, in 2015, four years later, not 50 or 60 years later, the self-driving car driving around Mountain View. Um, what is happening is our ability to manage and make meaning out of, like, like there have been rapid changes in vision um, and solving problems in computer science and AI that people were thinking were gonna take half a century, and they're not. It's rapid acceleration. And those same changes are having, can have a rapid um, advancement on how we understand and model learning. But what I'm concerned about, well, a couple concerns. One of them is, is we have all these great uh, data-driven tools that are driving in um, much more quickly how we can build these explanatory and predictive models of student learning. But we can't just be driving them from just the data. We have to be using in the theory that we have developed and refined over the decades of doing learning research. So we need both the analytic tools, the new data tools, and the theory to come together along with the subject matter experts to really build these explanatory and predictive models. And I'll just give a quick example of why I think it's so dangerous to just let the models essentially drive the theory purely empirically. Um, it's because, frankly, uh, people think that since a computer is creating the model, then it must be absolutely objective. It's evidence-based, it's from the data, a computer's doing it, it's objective. Yeah? No, no, because someone wrote the algorithm. <laughs> you know, someone made the decision about what factors to include. Or even if we're talking about a purely data-driven modeling approach, where you just feed it tons of data, like those 1.8 million learners that we fed it for the, that one study, the data has a bias in it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to carry the bias of all of the actions of the people whose data you collected. And my one example of that, I, I shared this with um, Bridget a while ago, uh, not last year, I almost last year, the year before, uh, the Stan Stanford men's basketball team was knocked out before the Final Four. The women's basketball team made it to the finals. And so it was the night of the women's basketball 
game, one of the finals, and I didn't know what time it was. I wanted to make sure, you know, I knew what time it was so I could watch it because, you know, I'm trying to be a big Stanford athletic supporter. And so I pulled out my phone and I said, Siri, what time is the basketball game tonight at Stanford? What Siri said to me was, I'm sorry, the basketball team at Stanford last played on March 13th and were eliminated, da 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 da, -da. Their next game will be sometime in near the fall. Oh, let me try again. Siri, what time is the women's basketball game at Stanford? That game is at 7 p.m. in da 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 da. So, so, so the, da the data, I mean, was an honest mistake Siri made that when someone said basketball, they meant men's basketball. And so when I asked about basketball and didn't put women's in front of it, it did not return any information about the women's basketball game. So that's kind of the, the, the assumptions and biases that are built into our data. Which, um, so another project that I'm working on is a, an NSF funded project in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, and the University of Memphis to build these back end data structures for the purposes of science, for science of learning research. And all of the tools um, all of the data in a protected sense is openly available to anybody to use for forwarding scientific uh, purposes. So I'm not gonna go into great detail about this except for to say I invite everyone in this room who wants to use our data, get access to our data, share your data, build tools so that we can all collectively start to understand and build our science of learning, big invitation uh, to do that. Um, and then the, the other place where we can be using the data is in the analytics that we're using to give feedback to the learners and to the instructors, to the administrators. And I was thrilled to hear about the, you learn more about the MAPS project that you're doing. And then some of the other projects where people are really taking the data and sharing it and learning from it and building the science. Because to actually move this place forward, what we're really gonna need to do is build the relationship between research and practice. Which leads me to one thing I wanna say about uh, the, the model that we were talking about this morning about that higher education is a bit crippled by the fact that we have these three conflicting business models, that we have the, essentially the research model, the teaching and learning model, and then the revenue generation or community service model. And that it's kind of a problem because most institutions have three models, Stanford has 17. Um, actually, I don't think that that is, makes us vulnerable. I think the fact that we have the researchers, the practitioners, and the people that are intended to benefit from the research and practice all co-located all sharing a mission, that is a powerful competitive advantage that we have in our sector. Um, because we don't have to put up with what I would call the suboptimal linear technology transfer model of discovery. What I mean by that is in the traditional model, researchers do this research, get a finding, publish it, throw it over some wall, practitioners try and pick it up, interpret it, try and make sense out of it, try and implement it, it either works or it doesn't work, and you know there's no feedback loop. What we can do, what we have the real privilege of doing is to have the researchers and the practitioners collaborating so we can think about a real challenge in education, the achievement gap. And we bring, to, we bring the researchers in who have different theories like social belonging, identity threat, that deconstructing complex cognitive tasks. And you have the researchers and the practitioners co-constructing the intervention and collecting the data so that we can both simultaneously solve these educational challenges and make progress on our fundamental understanding of human learning because that is our core business. And anything, any business model, regardless of what business model you think higher education should be using, a core tenant of any business 
is you do not outsource your core business process. So if teaching and learning and research are our core business process, um, these educational technologies are becoming rapidly a core part of the teaching and learning process. Which brings me to this virtuous cycle. This is why I think technology will transform education. Because we can start off with our current theories, what we think we know about human learning, and use that to design our environments. Then we build those into the technology. We use the technology to do what it does really well, collect data and analyze data. We need a lot of help analyzing this massive amounts of data because there are too many dimensions for our little brains to handle by themselves. So once we've collected and analyzed the data, then we use that to refine our understanding of human learning and our models, and we use that to refine our technology design. And this sets up this virtuous cycle of continuous improvement. And I'll end with two quotes, um, which I always use, and they haven't I think they still are really meaningful, which is why I still use them. Um, one of them is from Herb Simon, who was a Nobel laureate at Carnegie Mellon. And he said back in 1991, improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. Now, I modified that in 2015 with not with Herb's permission, because he had already passed away, but I'm sure he'd be okay with it, um, to say improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching and courseware and platform and analytic system development from a solo sport, and I, I don't even just mean individual solo, I also mean institutional solo sport to a community-based research activity. And my last quote is from William Balmall, who was also an economist. And he said back in 1967, without a complete revolution in our approach to teaching, we cannot go beyond our current levels of productivity. And I said I've been using these quotes for a couple years because they really resonate for me. When I used to use this slide, I used to say, my message was, such a revolution is possible. I don't say that anymore, because that's not true anymore. What's true is, such a revolution is happening. It's happening. And my question is still the same. Who will lead it? And I actually think the UIA has made, <laughs> made a pretty good shot at stepping up and saying, yeah, we are. So I celebrate you for stepping up and saying, yeah, we're leading this revolution. Thank you.